your blood pressure is one of the first things that gets elevated when you're sleep deprived. Like your body is working harder to try to do basic functions. Today we're covering the four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And so with this said, what are some of the issues resulting from these different levels of sleep debt? Well, short-term sleep debt can lead to, number one, increased insulin resistance. That's one of the first things that we see. And this is one of the kind of telltale signs of being associated with diabetes and prediabetes. Insulin resistance, one of the classic signs of insulin resistance is carrying a, around more belly fat than we would have optimally. Another thing we see intrinsically is higher blood pressure. A lot of people don't think about that. Your blood pressure is one of the first things that gets elevated when you're sleep deprived. Like your body is working harder to try to do basic functions. Also, we see an elevation in stress hormones, obviously fatigue. That's kind of one of the obvious things that we see kind of classic signs. And also reduction in activity in your prefrontal cortex. This is super important. With the short sleep debt, we immediately see a reduction in activity in the part of your brain, the more evolved, quote, human part of your brain that's responsible for executive functions, for social control, for distinguishing between right and wrong, for decision making. That part of your brain goes cold. So guess what? You're going to have a tendency towards struggle at work, relationships, performance, and whatever the case might be, whatever you're trying to work on for that day. Also, we see a reduction or abnormality in the production and function of your sex hormones as well. So none of that stuff is good. And this is just, again, that's a short-term sleep debt. Those are just a few of the things we see. Long-term sleep debt, we see an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, cancer, obesity, mental illness, and all-cause mortality. Basically, your risk of dying goes up significantly if we're having this accumulation of long-term sleep debt. This is nothing to play with. but what we're talking about is the opportunity to adjust, to get better, to help ourselves to buffer whenever we do have the occasional sleep deprivation because your body is actually very forgiving and capable of paying back that sleep debt very quickly and maintaining health and well-being. But that's what this episode is really all about. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is just general causes of occasional sleep deprivation so that we got clear on what these things could be, all right? So number one, it could be work. Work could be one of the reasons behind accumulating a short sleep debt. Obviously, you know, if there's a, a, a project that's due or you're just really intense on a deadline and or the creation of something that has really got you inspired and, and your passion and your juices are flowing, and you just kind of want to burn the midnight oil, these things can happen and that's okay. Also, another thing is festivities. This is my reason for even doing this episode is because I was engaged in festivities, you know, um, dinners with friends, conversations, also work, you know, getting out. I had things that I had to get done all the while doing all of these things in a different environment, you know, mind you. So um, festivities can be one of those things, but that's okay. You know, if you go into a concert, comedy show, whatever, you don't want to be neurotic and like, you know, I got to get back, you know, I got to get to sleep. You want to have that in mind for sure. If you're playing at a high level with this health and well-being thing, but some of these things actually make life worth living. And it's a big part in this equation of, you know, do you become neurotic about getting enough sleep or do you get the benefits that come along with these experiences and help yourself to recover from that sleep deprivation by utilizing the strategies you're going to learn today. Also, another reason could be sex. You know, you could be up later getting your groove on, all right? This can happen. And again, the benefits can outweigh the potential downside of you being up a little bit later, all right? So again, don't be like, uh, honey, it's uh, 8.59. I'm going to need missionary right now because I got to get, you don't want to be that person, all right? Enjoy the experience. Enjoy the moment, all right? And also, by the way, chapter nine of Sleep Smarter talks about the benefits that come along with sex and sleep and the relationship and how sex influences sleep and how your sleep influences your, sl your sex life. And it is profound, all right? We release a cocktail of chemicals uh, with orgasm being oxytocin, for example, which has a counter effect to cortisol. So reducing stress and cortisol is a big player in keeping people what we call clinically tired and wired where the cortisol is too high at night, causing issues with falling asleep and staying asleep 
and it's too low in the morning, which causes issues with actually getting up and getting out of bed. Oxytocin is a buffer for that, all right? Prolactin, uh, norepinephrine, all of these things come in, in the package with having great sex, all right? So keep that in mind. This could be another reason for general cause of occasional sleep deprivation, all right? Another reason could be uh, just general travel. And again, that's another thing that I had kind of stacked on me. I might have had all of those four things, by the way. I might have all four things stacked. And the, uh, the adjustment is simply following these protocols, these insights that we're sharing today. All right, so travel and getting your body adjusted is gonna be key. Now, the very best way to recover from sleep deprivation, the very best way is to prevent it in the first place. All right, let's just be real. Let's get this out of the way before we get to this tactics and strategies and insights. Very best way is to prevent it in the first place or minimize it even, you know, just even minimizing it. And this can be simple planning, all right? Just simple planning and having a schedule, knowing where you're gonna be, what you're gonna be doing to the best of your ability so that you are, you know, able to enjoy the process, enjoy the moments, but also you have some structure, all right? So we wanna be more like, like Bruce Lee says, be water, my friend, all right? So you wanna have structure, but also flexibility. That's what water is. It's, in, it's immensely powerful. You know, and I know that just even staying at a beach house, like the ocean does, is powerful. It doesn't care. And it has this fluidity and flexibility, but also it can hit, right? It can hit harder than anything, all right? So you want to have structure, but also some flexibility within that structure. And I hope that makes sense. Now, one other thing that you can have in your superhero utility belt for having that structure and that planning is what I like to call, and I love you, but I'm out, standard. All right, you can pull that card out when need be. You don't have to stay until the club ends. You don't have to stay till the event's over. You could say, I love you, but I gotta go. All right, you, you can actually do that. But again, many instances, this is ideal, but sometimes it's just more healthy and life affirming to actually stay up and enjoy the moment and to connect, you know? So that's what we really wanna understand, kind of get that neuroses out of our mind. But today, now we're going to share some tools for you to utilize whenever you do find yourself sleep deprived for whatever reason it might be to quickly help you to recover, to get back on track and to feel awesome. All right. So this starts with number one, resetting your circadian timing system. All right. So your circadian timing system is this quote biological clock and it's as real as the clock on your smartphone or on your wristwatch, it is one of the most amazing structures in all of nature that we have built into our, into our genes. Our bodies are always trying to sync up with the planet, with nature, and look for these schedules. Like everything about us is on a schedule. Everything about us is on these uh, biological rhythms. How hormones are getting produ produced, it's a rhythm to it, all right? and especially when it comes to regulating our sleep. So when we're sleep deprived, one of the first things that we wanna do is to reset this circadian timing system because it's gonna be a little bit off. And so what can you do to actually make that happen? Well, the first thing I want you to, to be mindful of and to utilize is to get yourself some natural light exposure, all right, sunlight exposure. And so what can sunlight actually do for you? Well, this is so powerful in that your interaction with sunlight triggers your body to produce certain hormones and neurotransmitters that helps to reset and recalibrate your circadian timing system. So let me describe what I mean. Now, we're all driven by our genes by this light and dark cycle, all right? Your body is looking for these daily. It requires them daily in order to have optimal function of your genes. So let me give you an example of this. Research published in the journal Innovations in Clinical Neuroscience found that exposure to sunlight significantly decreases cortisol later in the day, all right, as compared to exposure to dim light during the day. So actually getting some sunlight in the day helps you to lower your cortisol at night. Now your cortisol is gonna be out of rhythm and it's gonna have a tendency to be higher in the evening if you're sleep deprived. All right, so this can help to reset that rhythm, get cortisol elevated during the day because sunlight actually encourages the production of cortisol. That's not bad. Listen, cortisol is a necessity for regulating your thyroid function, for example. So actually having, your thyroid is the master kind of regulator of your metabolism. 
in many senses. And it doesn't work unless you have cortisol. So cortisol being the bad guy, it's not the full story, all right? Cortisol is not the bad guy. It's just misunderstood, needs some love and attention, all right? Cortisol being produced at the wrong time and the wrong amount is where the problem really is, all right? So we want it to be produced during the day, that's normal. And if we look at a normal kind of biological rhythm, cortisol is gonna be spiked or peaked between the hours of somewhere around 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and gradually decline as the day goes on. And the decrease in cortisol allows for an increase in melatonin. But if cortisol is too high or at the wrong spot, cortisol and melatonin have an inverse relationship. So that means when cortisol is high, melatonin is going to have a tendency to be low and vice versa. All right, so be mindful of that. Sleep deprived, you want to make sure that when you do get up, get yourself some natural light exposure. All right, now, how does this play out in the actual research? There was a recent study conducted on office workers to look at the effects of folks who weren't getting access to sunlight exposure through windows, right? So they're in office settings where they don't even have windows, so they're not getting any natural light coming in that they are getting exposure to. And so they looked at that data compared to office workers who were getting adequate exposure to, to natural light coming in via windows. And here's what they found, this is nuts. They found that the office workers who didn't have access to natural light got an average of 46 minutes less sleep each night. Crazy, just that one parameter. They also found that this sleep deprivation that resulted from this resulted in more reported physical ailments, lower overall vitality reported, and poor general sleep quality. So even the sleep that they were getting wasn't the best. Compared with the office workers who got natural light exposure during the day, they tended to be more physically active, happier, and they had an overall higher quality of life. All right, so that's what it says in the research. Please understand, if you're going to help to buffer that short-term sleep debt, do your best to get yourself some exposure to natural light because number one, it's gonna help your body produce more um, serotonin, which is kind of this feel-good neurotransmitter. But here's one of the big secrets and something that's not really looked at is sun exposure helps your body produce serotonin. Serotonin is a precursor for melatonin. All right, so you're gonna produce more of that good sleep hormone when you get sunlight during the day, all right? And helps with this whole cortisol reset that we've been talking about. Another big part of the struggles that we see with sleep deprivation come as a result of a hit to your immune system. And so you're experiencing these not the best feelings because your immune system is down and your body's trying to, uh, trying to fight to keep it bolstered, if that makes sense. So please keep that in mind. That's one of the reasons that we don't feel the best when we're sleep deprived is because our immune system is taking a hit and is trying to get sorted out. So researchers at Georgetown University Medical Center found that blue light from the sun's rays are capable of boosting the activity of infection fighting T cells. All right, so sun exposure can help to fortify your immune system hit that you just took by being sleep deprived. All right, powerful stuff. And again, I want you to take that into account. Now, sometimes in some situations, and I know some people right now, it's like, I can't get that kind of access to sunlight. Well, the best thing that we can do, number one, we have to get rid of that story because where there's a will, there's generally 10,000 ways. But in the instance that you actually don't have adequate sun exposure or access to that, there are light therapy devices that I talk about in my book, Sleep Smarter. And a couple of them, there are visors, there are panels, there's all kinds of different tools that you can use. There's uh, light boxes that are clinically proven to be effective for things like seasonal affective disorder, right? So there's different options. But the best thing is getting that natural sun exposure. And also, last thing here with the immune system, we can't ignore the benefits that come along with sunlight in regards to boosting vitamin D, All right? So cholesterol in your system is converted into this valuable hormone that we call vitamin D, but it's actually a hormone that has an immense amount of incredible benefits in the human body. That sun exposure is the key to converting that cholesterol into the vitamin D that we all need. Now. In a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, this is the gold standard of studies, found that vitamin D supplementation lowered the risk of getting the flu by 58%. That's nuts. Please, 58% by supplementing with vitamin D. That's powerful. And again, your body produces it itself. Vitamin D isn't something, again, I'm not promoting that you go 
and start going ham on vitamin D supplements for these benefits, you wanna give your body the opportunity to do it naturally and then add in supplements as a supplement, all right, in cases where it's actually needed. So 58% boost, what, you might be like, well, what's the comparison with the flu shot? Like what's the effectiveness of the flu shot? We got 58% increased benefit here with vitamin D. What about the flu shot? Well, early findings for the 2018 flu vaccine indicate 17% effectiveness. It doesn't even compare, but yet they got the signs up, right? Get your flu shot, come in, get your, get your Pepsi, get your flu shot, get on your way. No, that's not the way to go about it, all right? If we're getting, why, is this, why does this generally come around during this time of year? We're generally not getting outside and we're generally not getting exposure to sunlight, all right? So there's some key nuances with sun exposure coming through windows that we need to talk about as well. And this is, there's UVA and UVB. And the type that actually converts uh, your cholesterol into vitamin D does not penetrate through windows. So I want you to be mindful of that. Uh, we do want to get sun directly on our skin if at all possible. And again, this might be a situation where we do supplement with vitamin D. But that natural light exposure, we have photoreceptors in our uh, you know, our optical receptors and our skin that pick up that sunlight, even if it's just in the room, and send data to your brain, to your nervous system, to your internal organs to produce correlated daytime hormones and set that circadian rhythm back on track. All right, so valuable, valuable stuff right there. If that one thing already, just to kick off the show, is to make sure we're resetting that circadian rhythm by getting some exposure to natural light or supplementing that natural light with some phototherapy devices. All right, second thing here with resetting our circadian timing system is exercise, all right? This is one of the very best things you could do. And this might be a situation where you don't necessarily, quote, feel like doing it, or you don't know if it's okay. But if you are partially sleep deprived, again, this is just an acute situation, one of the best things that you can do is when you do get up to do some exercise in that first maybe 30 minutes to an hour after getting up. Now, why does this matter? I've talked about this many times, and I think it's just super fascinating. And this was Appalachian State University. And I'm just gonna consolidate the study because I've shared it many times, but I really want you to get this. They took exercisers and tested to find out what time of day exercising has the greatest impact on our sleep at night. And so they had exercisers to train exclusively at 7 a.m. They had them train exclusively at 1 p.m. in another phase and exclusively at 7 p.m. in yet another phase. And they found that the morning exercisers spend more time in the deepest, most anabolic stages of sleep. They tend to get uh, more efficient sleep cycles. They tend to sleep longer. And also there's a 25% greater drop on average in blood pressure at night when people exercise in the morning. All right. So get some exercise in in the morning. That's all correlated with when we're talking about the blood pressure, I mentioned this in the beginning with the sleep debt. This can help to buffer that and reset that. And a correlation we see with uh, dropping your blood pressure in the evening is an activation of what's called your parasympathetic nervous system. This is also known as the relaxation response in the body or the quote, rest and digest system versus the fight or flight system or sympathetic that's gonna be more active when you're sleep deprived. All right, so get in some exercise to encourage, and here's why this actually works. This goes back to cortisol. This helps to do that cortisol reset. Your cortisol is gonna be a little bit abnormal because of the sleep deprivation. You get up, exercise, it gets that cortisol elevated to get it back on track, all right? So we get that elevation in cortisol to help to see that natural cortisol rhythm. All right, also, another benefit here is you're gonna produce more endorphins, right, from the exercise, some more enkephalines. Now, I'm not saying to go hard. I'm not saying to just exercise your face off, all right? That might not be the best idea. If it's a small sleep deprivation, all good. Like you can do your kind of normal normal thing. But if it's like a significant amount, chances are just do, you know, maybe a, a four minute Tabata, go for a power walk, something like that. But get up, get moving, get some exercise in because it can really do a lot of good. Now I want to make an important point here in regards to our relationship with getting up in the morning and exercising. You know, this is something I've seen over the years and I still get a lot of questions about this or just people are kind of glancing past it when they're telling me about an issue that they have. And this is where we see a situation where folks are getting up an hour or two earlier in order for them to work out. All right, an hour or two 
earlier than they would naturally be sleeping so they can get to the gym or get this workout in? And is it really worth it? So I can tell you unequivocally, getting more sleep is your best bet. All right. Now, why am I saying this? Well, this is from the Canadian Medical Association Journal that showed that continuous sleep debt is directly related to an inability to lose weight. What? Let me say that again. Sleep debt is directly related to an inability to lose weight. Even and with the test subjects, even with the exact same diet and exercise program, test subjects who got less than six hours of sleep per night consistently lost less weight and body fat than those who are not accumulating this sleep debt. All right, please, please hear this. If you're sacrificing your sleep in order to work out more, you might as well just go ahead right now and phone this in as a defeat. Because, of course, we can see some short-term changes, but long-term, we're really setting ourselves up for failure. And our best bet, again, is to make sure we're getting adequate sleep and structuring into our day more high-quality movement and also the most effective exercise. If time is an issue, which, listen, if, you're, if you don't have, like, 10 kids, all right, and, like, two full-time jobs and... You know, you also work at the circus part time, like whatever, unless you got a schedule like that, you do have time. All right. It's just, again, having that structure and that flexibility within the structure. Great example, Steve Weatherford, man, he's got five kids, count them five, four girls. Oh my goodness. Four daughters. All right. And a son. And plus, you know, this guy is coming from an NFL career where he decided on his own accord to retire and to focus on service to other people and growing himself personally, but also growing a brand and, and a company, several companies, right? I'm telling you, and guess what? It's part, he's built it into his day. He's built it into a part of his success practice, a part of his work because it makes everything else work better. All right, so please do not sacrifice your sleep in order to exercise. That's not a good idea. You're setting yourself up for failure. All right, and I really want you to get that. But again, if we've got a story that this is the only time that I can exercise is early in the morning, I got to get up at, you know, the butt crack of dawn and get this in, you know, four o'clock in the morning, make sure that you get into bed earlier then, all right? Make sure that you're getting adequate amount of sleep. Now, also I want you to be mindful of this, getting up too early, if it's not necessary, can also set an abnormal circadian timing system. All right, that could cause you problems later down the road because I said naturally we see that spike, right? In the little bit later part of the morning, maybe we'll say 7 a.m. to maybe 10 a.m., all right? And it's okay to exercise within, you know, an hour or so of that. But once we start getting into like, you know, folks waking up super early, unless, and you'll notice these, these are the hacks from the greats who are doing it, it's, it's sustainable. You know, if you look at somebody like Eric Thomas, number one motivational speaker in the world, and he's getting up at like three o'clock or three thirty every day, but he gets to bed early as well. And he's getting what we call this money time anabolic window. You get a bigger anabolic window, more recovery when you sleep earlier. And according to the research, this is between the hours of like 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. ish, depending on the time of year. And, you know, daylight savings, you got to take into account all these things. But generally in that sphere, because of the production of melatonin, it's going to help you to have more efficient sleep. When you go to sleep within that time frame, you're going to have a tendency to produce more human growth hormone, also known as a youth hormone, and it's uh, muscle sparing. And you're also going to produce just more anabolic reparative hormones and enzymes that keep you better longer, recovers your brain and body faster. All right, so wherever you lie on the spectrum, just please understand, we don't want to sacrifice our sleep in order to exercise if we're trying to get fit. We really need to focus on getting optimal sleep and doing smart exercise because if time is an issue, you can get an incredible workout that changes your body within 10 minutes if you're doing the right stuff. And that's the stuff we talk about here on the Model Health Show. So I'll, I'll put a link to the episode we did on high intensity interval training in the show notes for this one. And it's a classic and it'll provide you a lot of value and a lot of different options. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Now, one other tactic that I want to share with you that is in the same vein of helping to kind of reset this circadian timing system is getting grounded, all right, getting grounded. So what, it, what does this actually mean? It's also known as earthing. 
Now, this is one of those things that was really difficult for me to wrap my mind around because I'm a very analytical, see it and I believe it kind of person, you know, just generally that's kind of how I operate. And, but when I saw the research and also having some uh, uh, testing mechanisms myself to actually see the response when I'm grounded versus when I'm not, totally changed my, my belief system around it. And so grounding really goes back to this basic understanding that the human body itself is, we're bioelectric entity, all right? So just take a second, I want you to really think about this. Our bodies are incredibly conductive and there's a certain electricity that powers us, all right? And to give you some examples, when you're, you know, if you see somebody's in the hospital and they're on the, the heart monitor, right? And you're seeing that boop, boop, right? You're seeing that movement, right? What is that measuring? That's measuring the electric currency from your heart, right? The electricity it's putting out. That's powerful, right? You know, same thing. If we think about electrocution, right? We hear electric electrocution. You're very, very conductive. You can get electrocuted fairly easy, all right? Because your body has this bioelectric tendency and system built into it. So that's the number one principle. Your body is this bioelectric energy field. Now, here's the thing. There's this external thing, just even on the surface of our skin, if we touch something that's accumulated the static electricity or we have, we get shocked. So we are absorbing and giving off this electricity. The key here is that we absorb it as well. We absorb electrons. And the greatest source, when we're talking about antioxidants and we're talking about electron transfers and absorbing this energy from food where does all the food come from where does all the real food come from it comes from the earth all right so when you're getting grounded you're getting in contact physical contact with the thing that's providing you all of those free electrons through the food you're eating but you can get it through skin to earth contact all right because the earth surface itself is brimming with free electrons that we now know for a fact can get transferred to the human body and it has some really profound benefits. But the question is, how often are you actually in contact with earth? This is something that humans have evolved with. And many researchers who are experts in this field would say that this is a big correlation to the reason we have so many diseases today is our uh, inconsistency with getting exposure to getting grounded, all right? Because it dissipates all of that static electric buildup and also draws in all of these free electrons to help to basically provide electrons to these uh, free radical events happening in our bodies, all right? They're missing an electron, these quote free radicals, this free radical activity. And so when that electron is provided, it helps to reduce that inflammation that's resulting from the free radical activity, all right? So at some point we'll do a whole masterclass on this topic, but I want you to get the, the overview of what it looks like and what grounding is and how it works. But um, I also wanna share some of the research. So this was a study published in the Journal of Environmental and Public Health. Researchers found that test subjects that were grounded, quote, had rapid activation of the parasympathetic nervous system and corresponding deactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. Come on, please understand. This is, this is clinical data here. This isn't just like airy fairy, I think this works. By you getting yourself in contact with the surface of the earth, you actually have this intrinsic rapid activation of this relaxation response. You know, your parasympathetic nervous system immediately. That's incredibly valuable, all right? And a deactivation of the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. But are you taking advantage of this? Because it's free. You know, that's one of the things that we know we generally can't wrap our minds around, especially if it's free, you have free access to. And by the way, before we go any further, I want to make sure you know what's conductive. Uh, dirt, dirt is conductive. It's one of those things, dirt, grass, mud, all right, uh, soil, those are uh, conductive surfaces, all right. We've also got sand. This is why many people have the experience of like going to the beach, and they're getting relaxed, very relaxed and sleepy. You think it's just the serene environment, but it's actually, this might be one of the rare times that somebody is getting grounded and they're activating that sympathetic nervous system immediately. Bodies of water, same thing. You know, if you're getting into the ocean, you're getting into lakes. Concrete is semi-conductive, all right, semi-conductive. Uh, asphalt is not conductive. Uh, wood 
is not conductive. So just be mindful. You know, these are just some different things to be mindful of, but there's also this grounding technology, this earthing technology where you got bed sheets and mouse pads and things like that that are connected to the grounding uh, of the particular building that you're in, all right? So I'll put that in the show notes, you know, some resources to look into that. Bottom line is, this is one of the first things I do when I get off of a flight, I find a way to get grounded, you know, get my feet on the ground, if at all possible. And or I used to always travel with my grounding um, utilities. I definitely do so a lot less because I like to get the natural experience. So here's another study. I just want to share this one with you as well. This is a study published in 2004, looked at the biological effects of grounding the human body during sleep as measured by cortisol levels and subjective reporting of sleep, pain, and stress. The study found that patients who were grounded during sleep had reduced nighttime levels of cortisol. It reduced cortisol at night and overall normalization of cortisol secretion through the day. So this is a cortisol reset. It's a reset of your circadian timing system. This is what helps you to recover faster from that acute sleep deprivation. All right, get yourself grounded. It can do a lot of good. Today, we're covering the four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. Again, these are things that are very pervasive in our culture. And unbeknownst to you right now, it might be something that is causing issues with your sleep cycle. It might be causing issues with you falling asleep and staying asleep and just going through that natural rhythm that we really require in order to get sufficient healthy sleep. So let's start with this statement first and this discussion, which is what is sleep really? Well, when we're looking at this conversation about sleep, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Sleep is weird, but it's something that is required because we would have evolved out of it long ago if it wasn't something that was of the utmost importance for human evolution and survival. Because it's during sleep, because of our incredible brains, they're doing so many different processes for us. And many of these processes, we need to shut things down because so much energy is required to do housekeeping with our brains. Here's a little fun fact that you might not know. Your brain actually shrinks while you're asleep. I know it sounds weird and might be like, I don't want that. I'm going to stay awake forever. This is actually a good thing because your brain swells throughout the day because of all of the uh, metabolic waste products that get accumulated, right? Your brain is doing millions of processes a minute and there's new cells uh, being created. Old cells are dying. You know, there's a lot of waste products and we have to get that stuff out. Your brain has to, quote, detoxify itself. And there's the blood-brain barrier. So there's not a direct connection with your lymphatic system, which kind of handles the cellular waste management of the rest of your body. Your brain has its own system. It's called the glymphatic system. And this glymphatic system is a little shout out. It's run by the glial cells in your brain to help to eliminate these wastes. And your brain can shrink about 20% during sleep as it's getting rid of these wastes. And this glymphatic system is 10 times more active during sleep than when you're awake. This is when that housekeeping takes place. And we know today that issues with uh, conditions like Alzheimer's, which is now the sixth leading cause of death, all right, sixth leading cause of death today, that Alzheimer's is now found to be related to an inability of the brain to detoxify itself. Now, this is correlated with what else is happening in our society, massive issues with sleep deprivation. And this is my argument is that this is one of the things we need to address so you can start to see a reduction in these rates of conditions like Alzheimer's. And that's just one component of it. But when we're talking about sleep, so what is it? Sleep is this really interesting phenomenon where we see repair and improve function of our brains, of our muscle, you know, things like muscle repairs taking place. Our hormones are getting optimized and back on track because there's different hormones as we go throughout the day, different hormones are being produced. And during sleep is a crucial time because it's a very anabolic state where you're producing a lot of anabolic hormones. But we, how do we know we're asleep? We know that we're asleep. We can monitor this when we see changes in our brain waves. To really make it super simple, sleep is a change in our brain rhythms. All right. So as we're awake right now, we're in a state of beta. 
right? We've got these beta waves taking place for the most part. We can get into some gamma too, right? We can get into some gamma. But from there, we transition as we move into sleep. We move into the alpha. It's a very uh, relaxed state of focus. If we're awake and can get into the alpha state, right? So that's something that we transition into. Then from the alpha, we move to theta. This is that transitionary st state into sleep. And then we move into delta, right? That's a that deep anabolic sleep. And we're cycling throughout these, throughout the night. And we need to spend an adequate time in each stage of sleep. And depending on which expert you talk to, we've got four stages of sleep. Cycling predominantly what we talk about is REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And REM sleep is the rapid eye movement sleep, right? This is when you are getting your dream on. This is also where a big part of memory processing takes place and converting what you're learning even right now to your short-term memory, right? It's becoming more consolidated and filed away during sleep. And so on average, our sleep cycles are somewhere around 75 to 120 minutes in some cases, going through all of those four stages efficiently. And during your first part of your sleep in the evening, you're going to spend more time in Delta. And as the the night goes on, you spend less and less time in Delta during each sleep cycle. And so all of these stages are important, but they can be interrupted. They can be interfered with. They can be damaged by certain things that we are exposed to today. And so today, again, we're going to cover the four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And we're going to start number one with something called MSG. All right, MSG or monosodium glutamate. It's labeled as a flavor enhancer that's been used in food production for decades now. And monosodium glutamate is simply the sodium salt or the ionic form of glutamic acid. And now this is an amino acid that is one of the building blocks of many proteins. So it's something that we need, we, we require, but this is the ionic form of it. And some of it occurs naturally in the cooking process or even fermentation process. And that's all good. But commercially processed MSG is a potential culprit in several health issues. So let's just start with this before we get into the sleep connection. And by the way, so what is the flavor enhancement? What is it? It really plays on that umami fla uh, flavor sensation. So we've got sweet and salty and bitter and sour but the other one that is kind of newly discovered and talked a little bit more about is umami, right? First of all, I just like saying umami, but that's more of the savory kind of thing that's attributed to the flavor and, and um, uh, experience of things like broth and different meats and things like that. So that's that umami flavor. So MSG really enhances that. Now listen to this. Research published in the journal Obesity confirmed that animal studies indicate monosodium glutamate can induce hypothalamic lesions, lesions in the brain and leptin resistance, possibly influencing energy balance and leading to obesity. Wow. When we hear like, oh, it's controversy around this, we don't know what MSG really does. It's right here. It's in the journal Obesity. And so leptin resistance, potentially this could be a huge culprit in obesity because leptin is your body's major satiety hormone helping to really regulate your appetite. And so when leptin, when you have leptin resistance, this is going to inherently lead to being hungrier more often. All right. So that's what they're seeing in animal studies. But what about the people? What about the people? A human study published in 2008 in the journal Obesity looked at the MSG intake of 752 people between the ages of 40 and 59 and found that MSG consumption was directly correlated with higher rates of being overweight. The study also accounted for other factors like physical activity, total energy intake, and MSG was clearly a culprit connected to having a higher body mass index. All right, there you have it. It's not just, I don't know if it's a potential issue. It probably is. It probably is. Now, where is it? Where is MSG sneaking its way into your body? Well, it's used pervasively as a flavor enhancer in things like fast food and restaurants and frozen meals and canned soups, potato chips and things like that. Now, 
what this is kind of labeled as out there, which is, this is the controversial part about it, is this category of what are known as excitotoxins. And according to Dr. Jo Joseph Mercola, and he was on the show a while back, we put that episode in the show notes, quote, MSG is one of the worst food additives on the market and is used in canned soups, crackers, meats, salad dressings, frozen dinners, and much more. It's found in your local supermarkets and restaurants, in your child's school cafeteria, and amazingly, even in baby food and infant formula. And he goes on to say that one of the best overviews of the very real dangers of MSG comes from Dr. Russell Blaylock, a board-certified neurosurgeon and author of Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. In it, he explained that MSG is an excitotoxin, which means it overexcites your cells to the point of damage or death causing brain damage to varying degrees and potentially even triggering or worsening learning disabilities, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, and more. And part of the problem is that free glutamic acid is the same neurotransmitter that your brain, nervous system, eyes, pancreas, and other organs use to initiate certain processes in your body. Even the FDA states this, quote, studies have shown that the body uses glutamate and amino acid as a nerve impulse transmitter in the brain, and that there are glutamate responsive tissues in other parts of the body as well. Abnormal function of glutamate receptors has been linked with certain neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's chorea. Injections of glutamate in laboratory animals have resulted in damage to nerve cells in the brain. Now we know that this has a significant impact on our brains and other cells in our bodies. But what about the sleep connection? Listen to this, this is nuts. A 2013 study published in the journal Nutrition found that MSG intake was significantly associated with snoring and a high probability of sleep disordered breathing in test subjects who were of a normal body weight. What? That is nuts. MSG is related to sleep disordered breathing. Snoring, this is another big epidemic right now because trust and believe if you have sleep disordered breathing, you're going to be having interrupted sleep cycles because that lack of oxygen is going to cause you to come out of different stages of sleep. You might not be conscious of it. You might not fully awake but it's going to interrupt because it's a survival response if you're not getting enough oxygen in. Now, I specifically wanted to share this information about MSG because this is something that has been anecdotally a problem for me, causing issues with my sleep. And I didn't know this at first, but this is the benefit of really doing this work and getting more in touch with your body is that you start to see different patterns and when something is different that you maybe eaten or that you did different with your activity, and it might have an impact on your sleep, for example. And I was able to analyze consistently because a lot of the recipes we were using at the time was incorporating some, you know, soy sauce and things like that that typically have some, sometimes it's naturally occurring and uh, sometimes it's added MSG in it. And every time I would have this very strange, like not, I couldn't quite fall asleep. I was just like, just below the surface of consciousness, if I could explain it like that. And it was just like, it was terrible. It was just terrible sleep whenever I would have it close to bedtime. And sure enough, recently, because it's been a couple of years since I've like gone out and we went to BF Chang, I never been. What's the, I wanted to know what's the big deal. You know, they got the statues outside, the big, the big horse sculptures. I'm like, it must be something. So we had uh, the PF Chang's for dinner. I had some dishes that had some soy sauce in it. And sure enough, I had that crummy sleep that night, especially like the first phase and trying to fall asleep. My sleep latency was disturbed, which is literally the opposite for me 99.9% .9 of the time. And I knew, okay, wow, that's, it really does affect me. Now, everybody's gonna be different. You know, it might not have that kind of an impact on you, but this is something that I wanna make sure you have this information in your possession because it might be helpful for you now, maybe later, and also for the people that you care about potentially. And uh, what I wanna share is this, the final straw for me in putting this on the list that broke the sleep deprived camel's back was a 10 week study cited in the journal Pediatrics reported that more than 50% of hyperactive children showed fewer 
behavior problems and less trouble sleeping when they implemented a diet that was free of artificial and chemical food additives, including monosodium glutamate. And the next culprit we're going to talk about on our list, specifically those two things were the main things that they pulled out, which we're going to get to that in a moment. But I want to make sure that you know some of the hidden names of MSG, because sometimes it won't say monosodium glutamate on the label. This could be in the name of hydrolyzed vegetable protein or textured vegetable protein, yeast extract, seasonings. What is seasonings? Just tell me what the season is, you know? And again, sometimes companies are doing the right thing and they're literally just, you know, it's a, maybe a secret ingredient of seasonings, right? Maybe it's just, you know, a little sea salt, a little uh, sugar, you know, some paprika, I don't know. But sometimes it's just a blanket way that you can slide some MSG in there as well. So uh, just keep that in mind. What we want to do is if you do potentially have some uh, issues with MSG and, you know, things like soy sauce, just make sure that you have it a little bit early in the day. It doesn't bother my sleep if I have it, you know, for lunch, for example, because my body can have time to metabolize it. But this might be something you need to pull out completely. And even here in that study with the kids, that is really something to think about and to really support and protect our, our babies. All right, so that's number one on our list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. Let's move on to number two. It was a study conducted by researchers at Wayne State University School of Medicine. And what they discovered was that having a cup of coffee or even caffeinated tea too close to bedtime can be terrible for your sleep quality. What they did was they gave test subjects caffeine right before bed and or three hours before bed and or even six hours before bed and found that even six hours out that caffeine consumption led to measurable disruptions in their sleep quality. All right, so caffeine can be a big problem. That's number two on our list with disrupting your sleep quality. Now, there's a clear distinction that I got to make right here because there's a difference with the objective and subjective experience with this caffeine consumption and sleep. So in the study, the test participants subjectively thought that they got the same amount of sleep. You know, we'll just say it's eight hours. But objectively, using sleep monitor, they found that the test subjects, when they had caffeine even six hours before they went to bed, they lost about an hour of their sleep. An hour of their sleep quality was lost. All right, so they might think subjectively, oh, I slept for eight hours, lost a full hour because of caffeine being active in their system. Now, what is going on? First of all, full disclosure, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of caffeine. I think it's, I think it's gift. I think it's great, but it all needs to be in its proper perspective because we could definitely abuse it and we can use it in ways that, that definitely can hurt us. And one of the things about it is that caffeine has a half-life of on average about five to eight hours. So that means, we'll just say you consume 200 milligrams of caffeine. And that's a normal, we'll just say a cup of coffee, right? So half-life is after, if, we'll just say the half-life is eight hours. So if you consume 200 milligrams, eight hours later, half of it is still active in your system. So 100 milligrams. And you gotta keep in mind that caffeine is a very powerful nervous system stimulant, right? And then. After that, eight hours later, half of it is still active in your system. So half of the hundreds so of 50 milligrams, that could be enough to stir up the pot. It could be enough to stir up the, the kittens in your mind. What? Why did I say that? <laughs> it could be enough to really cause disruptions with your, with your sleep quality. So keeping that in mind, number one, caffeine is a very powerful nervous system stimulant. Also caffeine, what it does directly is it elevates your cortisol and adrenaline, those are part of the reason why you get the stimulation from it, all right? So it, it, it causes the secretion of stress hormones, all right? So that's the second thing. But I also want to share this with you because caffeine doesn't, quote, give you energy in the exact way that we tend to think it does. So we have the aspect of being a stimulant, yes, but a more interesting aspect in how it makes you feel like you're 
energized or not tired is that it has this really interesting connection with something called adenosine. Now, every day while you're awake, neurons in your brain are firing and producing a neurotransmitter byproduct called adenosine. Now, adenosine is not some, for years it was just considered like a, just a waste product, a throwaway product, but it's not that because as adenosine is being produced, it fits into receptor sites that start to nudge you to go to sleep. So this adenosine production, as it's being made in your body, it is fitting into receptor sites that start to make you tired, sleepy, relax. All right, now here's the interesting thing about caffeine. Caffeine has the ability, because it's so similar in its structure, to fit into receptor sites for adenosine. And so it can just sit in there, in those receptor sites, like a family member overstaying their welcome on your couch. And it just sits there. And your body is continuing to produce adenosine, which is going to nudge you to go to sleep, but it can't get into the receptor site. And so you actually don't even know how tired you are. So I hope that makes sense. Because the caffeine is sitting in the receptor sites, adenosine can't do its job to start to nudge you to go to sleep, to relax, to, uh, to take a nappy. Now, listen to this. What does this do over time is the question. And it starts to really throw off the normal rhythm or the, the, the actual normal functioning of your endocrine system and your nervous system, which is this beautiful symphony that's always working to keep you well. And so what happens when you have all this buildup and you don't actually shut things down and sleep and relax like your body is wanting you to do, this can lead to uh, elevated levels of stress hormones specifically, which can lead to a whole host of problems from issues with um, you know, anxiety to uh, accumulation of, of excess fat and to obviously sleep deprivation. So just keeping that all in context, this is one of the things that caffeine does. So if you're going a little bit too hard with the caffeine, this can definitely cause some problems with your entire circadian rhythm. All right, so these are all aspects of the interaction that caffeine can have with our, in relationship to our sleep and our health. But again, I'm a fan and I believe that we can take advantage of it and use it in an intelligent fashion. And it could be great. It could be great. But here's a couple of things that I want you to, to keep in mind to, to do so that's not causing issues with your sleep. I'm a big fan of consuming caffeine in the early part of the day because just even in the cycle of cortisol secretion, you're supposed to get a cortisol kick in the morning. That's a natural cortisol rhythm. And I think it can support getting that, that rhythm on track for a lot of people who are clinically, we call them tired and wired, where the cortisol is too low in the morning, causing them a difficult time to get out of bed, and it's too high in the evening, right? And they're just up. So this can help to reset that if we're having some caffeine in the morning for some people. And so what I would recommend is to have a caffeine curfew, just a time that we shut it down and we don't have caffeine the rest of the day. And that can be really helpful. And it depends on your metabolism for caffeine because again it could be somewhere on average five to eight hour half-life some people metabolize it even faster than that and some slower some might need to cut it out totally whereas others can have it a little bit later in the day but i would not go if you just say you're trying to get to bed by 11 i would still give myself a solid eight hours preferably more but a solid eight to be done consuming the caffeine all right i prefer even before noon but in our culture, we don't really think about this a lot, you know. I was at a, uh, you know, when we go to a nice restaurant, and then after you're done with your meal, you know, we're out for dinner, it's 8 o'clock, you're kicking it, you're gazing into each other's eyes. And then the guy comes over, he's like, hey, would you guys like a cappuccino? Coffee? What? N no, actually. And I was just, it took a while for me to really listen to it because I would just be like, no, I just never really thought about it. And it, it hit me that people do that because they're asking for a reason. Obviously, people are doing that. They're hitting that, they're hitting that cap. They're hitting that chino at night, right before bed, and then wondering why they're going to have issues sleeping. And again, this might not be conscious. And they just, the, the next day, maybe they had some wine or whatever, and they, they're having this hangover, you know, and these two things are competing and causing these different uh, endocrine and nervous system issues and, and stimulation and deprivation. It's just, you know, so just keep this stuff in mind. And maybe hopefully this can help you to think a little bit differently when you're out to dinner 
and whether or not you're going to have that cup of coffee, you know, at nine o'clock at night. It's probably not the best idea. Now, another small thing I want to direct your attention to is it's not just coffee that can be the issue. It's not just uh, tea, you know, caffeinated teas, but there are some other things that you might be chocolate, you know, having a a nice amount of chocolate in the evening might cause some issues, but chocolate also has some other compounds that are more relaxing too. But for some people, it might be an issue, you know, even having a, a hot chocolate in the evening. So just keep that in mind. What are the substances that we consume on a regular basis that have a nice amount of caffeine in it? Another one is kombucha. Kombucha, let me tell you, I, it's one of those things. I would have kombucha in the later part of the, the evening and it would cause that same weird kind of not really falling asleep sleep for me. And I didn't realize that it can have a potentially pretty uh, high amount of caffeine in it because it is fermented and using the, of course, you know, the, the kombucha, the, the mother is what it's called. But also uh, it's generally going to be a caffeinated tea that is used as kind of the base for making the kombucha. And so it will cause issues with me sleeping and also it can have a nice amount of alcohol in kombucha. I don't know if you knew that. In some states, like they actually, it's a warning on the bottle. Like the, it's like you got to be 21 to buy the kombucha, right? And I experienced this, you know, I remember I was driving home. I was in the passenger side with my wife and you know, we were young in our marriage still. And I'm sipping on a kombucha and she's driving, which is rare, by the way. I'm usually, uh, you know, the one putting in the miles, but I was kicking back, I was sipping on some kombucha and everything just got really funny to me. You know, I was just like laughing about silly stuff and just laughing and I couldn't really stop laughing. It's just what's going on. She's like, you sound like you're tipsy. And I was like, but I'm just drinking kombucha. Stop, stop it. And I'm just laughing about that. And come to find out, yeah, it does have a nice little bit of alcohol in there too, which again, could cause issues with sleep. Is alcohol proven to help us to fall asleep faster? Absolutely. It absolutely does. But one of the things that it can do is something called a REM rebound effect. And our REM sleep specifically gets damaged when we have alcohol too late to bedtime. So alcohol could have made this list as well. I might throw in a couple of bonuses. That is a bonus actually. All right. So having a uh, alcohol curfew, giving your body some time and also nature's solution to pollution is dilution. All right. So helping your body to process. What happens when you drink alcohol? You tend to pee a lot more because your body's just trying to flush it out. You know, so support your liver and your bladder and your kidneys and uh, just having a little bit more, more water can really help to eliminate uh, sleep issues and hangover symptoms. The hangover experience is just a result of having damaged REM sleep. That's why we really experience that uh, with alcohol. So just keep that in mind as well. Now, I also want to share with you a little hack when it comes to the caffeine side of things, because sometimes you're just going to be in a situation where, you know what, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're working late or maybe you are in that kick it, you know, like it's nine o'clock with friends and you're going to be out for a while and you're going to, and you're going to order that Chino. All right. You're going to, you're going to hit the Chino. And so what do you do? Here's a little hack for you. And this is using L-theanine. All right. L-theanine acts as an effective counterbalance to caffeine. Now, this is an amino acid that also is considered to be in the camp of nootropics, which are substances that may improve cognitive function. In fact, a placebo-controlled study published in the journal Nutritional Neuroscience found that versus consuming caffeine alone, taking L-theanine and caffeine in combination are significantly beneficial for improving performance on cognitively demanding tasks. All right, so just taking caffeine alone versus having caffeine with L-theanine, uh, the test subjects performed far better. Now, it's also known to amplify these alpha brain waves. So we talked about alpha being the transitionary stage as a lot of folks as we transition into sleep. But this can be a waking state as well that allows for a, a kind of calm centered focus. Now, it's also a natural anxiolytic, meaning it reduces anxiety in humans and can even reduce blood pressure and normalize heart rate. And it does this by reducing levels of stress hormones like cortisol, while substances like caffeine elevate cortisol. All right, so you see how this is a really interesting counterbalance. Now, L-theanine has also been shown to boost levels of 
GABA in your system as well, and other hormones and compounds that promote calm, focus, regulated mood, and good sleep. So GABA is related in that track as well. GABA is an important neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. In fact, it is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, which means that it blocks the action of excitatory brain chemicals, right? So L-theanine's connection to GABA is another way that it can support kind of counterbalancing caffeine and helping you to sleep. So if you've had caffeine a little late or a little bit too much, try some L-theanine, all right? So that's a little hack for you, but just keep in mind, like with any supplement, it should be respected and not overused because this is a supplement. It's not real food. We want to focus on food first and then supplements to be supplemental to the good stuff that we're doing. All right, so there's another little strategy for us addressing the caffeine issue in our sleep, but also simply taking some time off and cycling caffeine is a really great tool. And I personally do that, you know, so maybe if you're having caffeine five days a week, maybe you take two days off, or maybe you're doing it uh, pretty consistently for a month and then maybe take a week off or cycle things. We should really cycle just about everything that we do, uh, unless it's a tonic, which is something that is, you know, historically that is, it's used daily and it just has a more and more beneficial effect as it kind of uh, accumulates or has an exponential benefit for you. But most stuff needs to be cycled. And so I would cycle my caffeine. All right. So that's number two on our list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And so now we're going to move on to numero trace. Number three here on our list is going to probably trip you out a little bit and something that can be potentially damaging your sleep that is just incredibly widespread today. And this is based on a study, and this is published in the journal Neuropsychobiology, looked at the effect of electromagnetic fields like that of Wi-Fi and cell phones and the impact that it has on healthy human test subjects. The study results found a REM suppressive effect with reduction in duration and percentage of REM sleep when exposed to Wi-Fi cell phone radiation. Moreover, researchers discovered qualitative abnormalities of the EEG signal. This is used to measure the brain's electrical activity during REM sleep. So these exposures that we're all just pervasively exposed to today has an impact. It can literally damage your REM sleep. The researchers said, quote, knowing the relevance of REM sleep for adequate information processing in the brain, especially concerning memory function and learning processes, the results emphasize the necessity to carry out further investigations on the interaction of this type of electromagnetic field and the human organism, end quote. What we got to understand is that this is a new technology, all right? This is something that we have not been exposed through to throughout our evolution as humans. This is very, very new, and we don't really know the long-term ramifications. We're playing with these energies, and we don't know how they interact and could be affecting our bodies. Now, let's just get real basic for a moment here, just using our just common, basic, simple knowledge base. We understand Wi-Fi, for example. Wi-Fi can go through walls, floors, ceilings. It's, it can go through all this stuff. You think it can't go through you? You think it's not going into your body and through your body and interacting with your cells? It absolutely is. It's just, it's Captain Obvious because more so than the walls and the floors, you are a much more permeable and even conductive entity than your floors, all right? And you are an electromagnetic being yourself. And so of course these things travel through us and um, interact with our cells. And this is one of the things that we're seeing is that it can cause issues with cellular communication, thus issues with hormones and neurotransmitters and just how your body is functioning. We don't know, again, the long-term ramifications, but I just want to put a spotlight on this for, for us to think about it. And we could do some things to potentially limit some of the exposure because we don't really know yet. But we don't need to walk around with the tinfoil hats because, you know, wi I, I like Wi-Fi, okay? When I get on the plane, give me the Wi-Fi, 
all right? Let me get that Wi-Fi password whenever I go to your house. I need that, all right? But if we could put this in a little bit of perspective. And so what I want to share with you, and this is direct from chapter 12 in my book, Sleep Smarter. And this says, researchers at Lowborough University Sleep Research Center in England set out to test the impact of cell phone radiation on the human brain. In the study, they strapped cell phones to the heads of study participants and monitored their brain waves by EEG while the phone was switched on and off by remote computer. The experiment revealed that after the cell phone was switched to the talk mode, as if you were on a call, brain wave patterns called delta waves remained depressed for more than an hour after the phone was turned off. These delta brain waves are the most reliable marker of deep sleep. A significant portion of your sleep consists of this stage, and interference with it will have a noticeable effect on sleep efficiency, which is exactly what the researchers observed. When the test subjects were allowed to go to sleep, they ended up remaining awake twice as long after the phone was shut off. They could not fall into deeper levels of sleep for nearly one full hour after the cell phone radiation stopped playing hide and go seek with their brain waves. Now, again, that's directly from Sleep Smarter, chapter 12. Maybe you want to check that chapter out again, or if you haven't read Sleep Smarter yet, what? Make sure you grab yourself a copy. You could even grab the audio book. And uh, this is just crazy, you know, just being able to see it directly impacts your brain waves. That's nuts. That's nuts. And so, yeah, there's recommendations out there about not holding your phone up to your head. But what do we do? It's a phone. It's a phone. What do you expect? But we don't have to sleep with our phone right on our pillow with us. Because right now we've got millions of adults who are sleeping with their phones. And it's just a very, again, this is new. And this is an abnormal behavior that could have some abnormal side effects. So what are some of the things that we can do for supporting our own health and our, and our sleep as far as Wi-Fi exposure and cell phone uh, radiation? Number one, something very simple is to put your phone in another room when you go to bed potentially. And some people might, I just can't do it. That's like putting my arm in another room. What? I can't. Listen, there's a 99.99% chance it, everything's going to be okay. The world is not going to end because your phone is not right there next to you on your pillow. All right. You're going to be all right. If the world ends, I'll call you. Okay. Put your phone will be in the other room. So don't worry about it. But anyways, you're probably going to be okay. All right. So at least giving some space. All right. So if you do have it in your room, because a lot of folks will be like, Sean, well, it's my, it's my alarm clock. How am I going to get up in the morning? Get an alarm clock. Get an actual alarm clock if your phone is your issue. Because some folks, you know, just that's the last thing we do before we go to sleep. We stare at our phones, which we know the impact that it has on increasing cortisol and suppressing melatonin. We've talked about that many times on the show. Or if we happen to wake up, we don't do like our ancestors did, which they would have these... Um, dual phases of sleep, basically those dual sessions. Sometimes, you know, you can sleep through the night or, you know, some folks historically would wake up, you know, they go to bed when the sun goes down, first of all, so you have time to do this. And maybe they sleep for four hours, then they get up and, you know, maybe they write by candlelight or they eat or they have sex or they um, do, some, do some reading or talking, but then they go back to sleep for another, you know, three, four hours, you know, till the sun comes up. And so that's normal. But today, if we happen to wake up and your cell phone's right there, you're screwed. You get on your cell phone, guess what's going to happen? Stimulation of your brain, elevation of stress hormones. It's just the name of the game. So let's get a better relationship with our, with our device. So that's number one. Or and if it is closer to you, put it on airplane mode at least, right? Put on airplane mode just as a little safeguard, it's a tiny thing, but these tiny things might accumulate and we might know years from now that, oh wow, these cell phones being next to us while we're sleeping was an issue. And so I don't want you to be that much of an experiment right now. So that's that. And also uh, something that I do that I learned from Katie Bowman, I put my Wi-Fi on a uh, electrical timer. So it's just a little simple thing I got from Amazon. It's just, you know, I think it was like 10 bucks maybe. And it sets your outlet on a timer. So we got the Wi-Fi plugged into that and it just will basically shut off 
uh, at a certain time. You know, I could set it for 11 o'clock at night or, and then set it to come back on at 5 a.m. or whatever the case might be. But just giving my space, you know, in my home some time to not have that pervasive Wi-Fi umbrella just bathing, that we're bathing in it. Now, this might be a little bit, this is even on the edge for me of being like a little bit concerned because we don't have enough data. But I have enough data to make me cautious and to make me ask questions. And so that's all I want you to do. You know, we don't got to break out the tinfoil hats, like I said, but we do want to start to pay attention to this because we're only going to learn more and more and more as the years go on as far as our exposure to Wi-Fi and our cell phone radiation. All right, so that's number three on our list, all right, of these four hidden things that can be deeply damaging your sleep quality. So let's move on. Now, we could move right to number four, but I want to add in a bonus one because I think this is, is very important for us to talk about this, and this is something that I took a chance on even putting this information into Sleep Smarter, and I'll tell you why in just a moment, but a renowned scientist and chemist, James Sprott, uh, PhD, he believed that sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, uh, can result from a variety of causes, but he felt that the number one concern was toxic gases and off-gassing of these mattresses generated from uh, what the babies were sleeping on. And he asserted that these compounds uh, containing phosphorus, arsenic, and other things that were added to mattresses, and still are, and for other purposes as early back as like the 1950s. And today, some of these compounds used to treat mattresses have actually been banned, all right? They've been banned. For example, uh, PBDEs. And PBDEs were used as a flame retardant, but a 2003 study published in the Environmental Health Perspective found that PBDEs were being found in alarming levels in mother's breast milk, in U.S. mother's breast milk. In 2001, study found that PBDEs were linked with behavior abnormalities. And this was uh, around 2004 where legislation uh, outlawed them and they've been phased out. But since then, it was determined that chemicals, uh, these PBDEs, were toxic to your liver, thyroid, nervous system. And again, they've been phased out because of that. But just, what? These are things that we've been doing and not really asking these questions. And so this is what I, I wrote about here in Sleep Smarter about his discovery because there was a really important nationwide program that took place in New Zealand to protect kids and prevent SIDS, right? Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And this was back in 1994. And understanding this startling data regarding the hazards of off-gassing mattresses, healthcare professionals throughout New Zealand actively advise parents to wrap their new baby's mattresses in an inexpensive, non-toxic, protective covering. And over the following 20-year span, there was not one single SIDS death reported among the more than 200,000 New Zealand babies who were sleeping on mattresses wrapped with a protective cover. While there was also 1,020 crib deaths reported since the mattress wrapping campaign began, none of those children were sleeping on the beds that were properly wrapped. And this is a tough conversation because when we're talking about our babies, we're talking about our kids, and it's just a sensitive subject. But I think that we shouldn't turn a blind eye to something like this and, you know, just a massive uh, application done and looking at how can we better protect our, our kids. Because it's not just the fact that they have these chemicals and it's off-gassing and this kind of thing, but also some of the things that can be causing these reactions are how uh, bacteria and funguses as mattresses are used over and over and over again. You know, it's passing it down kind of thing. Like I slept on a mattress when I was a kid, probably, you know, two people before me slept on, you know, but um, uh, bacteria and funguses interact with those chemicals and they can cause even more strange off-gassing. And so for me, I really took a chance. You know, I knew this research and I knew that though it's controversial, I wanted to share it just to err on the side of caution, you know, when it comes to our kids. And I'm looking at it right now and the note from my publisher and just saying, you know, are you sure you want to put this in here? We know that the data is pretty solid, but it's controversial and this could impact uh, some sales. And I definitely wanted to put it in there. And true story, I was uh, approached by the number one furniture 
company in the world who wanted to buy tens of thousands of copies of Sleep Smarter, right? I, I don't know how they found out about me. They you know, might have heard a talk or maybe they you know, listened to the show, you know, somebody who's you know, uh, a big person in the, in the company, and they reached out. And it, everything sounded great. Like I wanted people to have this information because you know, they're selling mattresses and just having that experience of knowing that our sleep isn't just about the mattress, but our overall lifestyle. And so I was like, you know, good to go with it. But I was also like, did you read chapter 15? Did you not get to that part yet? Because I'm kind of talking about the mattresses that you sell and how I'm, I cannot be an advocate for those mattresses. And sure enough, went, went cold. Conversations just diminished. And I guess they, you know, they got around to, to reading that chapter and I took that risk. That could have been uh, you know, a small fortune for me. And who knows what else, but I don't care. It's not about that. It's about doing the right thing. You know, and a lot of this stuff, we don't have the full story on, but we do have an obligation to share what we know and to share what we've experienced and just to be supportive of, of moving our culture forward. You know, like a lot of stuff that we've done, like we've been figuring out along as we go, that it hasn't been the best thing for us. And that's okay. You know, it's not saying that these companies are bad people that are doing things blatantly to hurt people. It's just a common practice and we didn't know. But now that we know, Let's change things. And so I just wanted to share that with you and to be aware that, uh, you know, we spend one third of our lives approximately on our mattress and it matters what mattress you're sleeping on and understanding that we probably don't want to sleep on mattresses that are treated with these crazy chemical, uh, you know, flame retardants and these synthetic chemicals and also realizing that we actually have a choice today because we're more aware and it's not just that part, but also there are about 70 million people every year that are having physician visits for sleep-related pain, right? Back pain, shoulder pain, hip pain related to the surface that they're sleeping on because of the loss of mattress resiliency is what it's called. Because when you lay down, your hips are the heaviest part of your body, and this can lead to some dysfunction and abnormalities in the curvature of your spine. And so... For me, knowing these things and also knowing about thermal regulation, which is important for uh, your, your optimizing your sleep cycle. There's a natural drop in your core body temperature at night to facilitate sleep. We do not like to be too hot when we're sleeping. We all know how that feels, but this is one of the things that has been found to disrupt your sleep cycle, which we've talked about m multiple times throughout this episode, is if you're running too hot. And many of these fancy, you know, uh, super luxurious memory foam mattresses and sleep numbers and all this stuff, they have these materials, you know, this memory foam that generates heat. Not only is it not supportive of this thermal regulation, but it can make you run a little bit hotter, which is one of those things causing you to have interrupted sleep cycles. And so for me, knowing these things, I was dedicated to finding like, what is the number one wellness mattress that has the best mattress resiliency, that, had, that sleeps cool and that is not treated with all those crazy chemical flame retardants and other synthetic uh, materials like boric acid is still commonly used today. And for me, that brought me to IntelliBed. And IntelliBed, which is unlike other mattresses in that it's three times more supportive than memory foam, yet it cradles your hips and shoulders to relieve pressure points up to 80% better than other mattresses. And it sustains that mattress resiliency so long that they actually have a 20 year warranty on their mattress. And it's not some prorated like little loophole trickery, 20 year mattress because it is so good. And it is utilizing this patented IntelliGel, which again, it sleeps cool and it really helps to support in that mattress resiliency and give you the support where you really need it. It's number one wellness mattress, sleeps cool, and I've been sleeping on IntelliBed for five years, probably longer than five years now. And I got IntelliBeds for all my kids as well. And I highly recommend checking them out. You can actually speak to one of their sleep experts to find out the very best mattress for you because it's going to depend on what your needs are as far as you know the mattress resiliency, the firmness, that kind of thing. So uh, head over there, check them out. It's IntelliBed.com forward slash model health. And that's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-B-E-D 
dot com forward slash model health together as one word. And you can check out a very, very exclusive discount for your mattress that only happens for my audience. They also are giving you free mattress covering and free delivery as well. And uh, I just recommend talking to one of their sleep specialists over there. So intellibed.com forward slash model health. All right. So that's thrown in there as a little bonus is to be mindful about our mattress and the actual surface that we're sleeping on. So let's move on to number four. The official number four is really number five here on the list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And number four, ooh, this is a tricky one. This is a trickster. Did you know that in DC Comics, there's not just the Joker, but they also have the trickster, all right? He's very, you know, he doesn't get the accolades. He doesn't get the, I think the trickster was like legit, just like a jerk, you know? The Joker kind of has some swag, but the trickster would like legit give you like a present with like some, some dog poop in it or something. I don't know, but he's not a popular character, just... Neither is this one. Well, actually, this one is super popular, but not for good reason, all right? The reason to be uh, popular for something positive, not this one, all right? And number five here on our list is sugar. Sugar. Now, we all know about sugar for issues related to diabetes and obesity and even cancer, but there's a study conducted by researchers at Columbia University that revealed that people who ate the most sugar in their diet throughout the day experienced more intrusions in their deep sleep cycles. Basically, they were being pulled out of deep sleep more frequently without actually waking up than those who ate less of the sweet stuff. Really, really fascinating. The lead author of the study also said that too much sugar can delay your body's release of melatonin. Now, we know melatonin to be this Uh, glorified sleep hormone, but it really helps to regulate your overall circadian rhythm. It's a powerful anti-cancer hormone, um, uh, anti-obesity hormone, because melatonin actually increases your body's production and mobilization of something called brown adipose tissue. That is a type of fat that burns fat, and the list goes on and on. Now, in relationship to this, we know about the sugar crash. So we just heard that even having sugar early in the day, like a high amount of sugar can end up causing you to have suppressed dysregulation with your deep sleep. But let's talk about in the context of like, what if we have sugar close to bedtime? We all know we, about that. Let's, we've, we've had this happen before. You know, we get that good sugar crash, right? You may, you know, maybe you go to IHOP, all right? First of all, what happened to International House of Pancakes? They were just like, forget it. Like, it's just too much to say. I don't appreciate that. I liked saying it, okay? It's like international. I've never been international, right? I barely left my city at that point. Now it's just I hop, I hop. As I digress. So maybe we have some, you know, we get the, we get the itis, right? We have that sugar crash. It's a good sugar crash, right? You have the, you know, the pancakes or, you know, um, whatever, candy and some cookies, whatever. Then you have the, the subsequent crash that takes place. You go into the itis, a little food coma takes place. We've all done it. Sometimes it can feel kind of good. You know, you get pancake drunk. But here's the problem. Research indicates that, you know, we have that sugar spike, which can be kind of uh, stimulation, and then we have that crash take place. Now, if depending on the timing of things, because I literally, for a time in my life, I would eat two bowls of cereal and a banana before bed. I'm talking like 30 minutes before bed. It was my evening routine. All right. And I was all about that, that honeybee. Okay. You know who I'm talking about. And I was all about that guy and, and the banana. And I, just, you know, I just thought, you know, it's whole grain, right? It said it on the box, it's heart healthy. And so uh, what, what could take place is you might go to sleep, but then you have this, uh, you can go hypoglycemic when you go to sleep. So your blood sugar gets spiked and then it, then it just crashes. It goes down during sleep and it won't necessarily be enough to wake you up, but there's gonna be a stress response. What happens when we go hypoglycemic? It's a stress response by your body because your blood sugar needs to be stable for survival. So it's gonna be a release of stress hormones like cortisol. And cortisol, guess what it does? It has this inverse relationship with melatonin. So cortisol can literally suppress melatonin. So 
you might be thinking I'm going to sleep and I'm going to get a great night of sleep and, you know, I'm going to get my eight hours, but you're not producing adequate melatonin or you're producing abnormal stress hormones and it's interrupting your actual sleep quality in, in, in the stages of sleep, right? Which again, it's between 75 to 120 minutes. We'll just say 90 minutes on average for each st- of the uh, sleep cycles where we go through all four cycles in those 90 minute increments. And this can cause issues with going through those cycles normally. All right, so I hope that makes sense. And so we wanna be really mindful of not having too much carbohydrate before we go to bed. But here's also what the study found was that eating more fiber was linked to spending more time in deep, slow wave sleep. Wow, you know fiber could do that. I knew it was like, you know, we think about in terms of, of, of the poop. And right now I'm thinking about um, the Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Drax. You know, um, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but uh, Rocket the raccoon, well, he's not really a raccoon, don't, don't tell him that. But he got into an argument with the main character, Star-Lord, played by Chris Pratt. And he was like, when you go to sleep, I'm going to put a turd in your pillowcase. And he's obviously like, don't do that. That's, that's terrible. That's disturbing. And he's like, I'm not going to put my turd because he's a little guy he's like i'm gonna put one of drax turds in your pillowcase and drax is like ha 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 ha. i have famously enormous turds now listen to this because when we think about fiber we tend to think about it in terms of digestive well-being and being quote regular but according to this research eating more fiber is linked to spending more time in deep anabolic sleep incredible The research suggested that it's possibly because fiber slows down digestion and doesn't cause a spike in blood sugar levels like many empty carbohydrates do. So this goes back to what I was saying about the timing of when you're consuming the carbohydrates. Also, the type of carbohydrates you're consuming could also be a big player in whether or not you're getting great high quality sleep. And so understanding how sugar is on this list and one of these things that could be behind the scenes causing issues with your sleep quality. Now this is something for us, it just adds another layer of understanding when we're really working to transform our lives, transform our bodies. It's not just to avoid sugar because we're trying to get you know six pack abs. It's more so understanding the things behind the scenes that really control your body composition, like your sleep quality. And understanding that when you're sleep deprived, guess what happens with your hunger for sugar? It goes up, right? Ghrelin is increased leptin is reduced and you are just generally going to be wanting more sugar and it creates a vicious circle because the sugar consumption is going to cause issues with our sleep so we need to break the pattern ultimately and really focus on our lifestyle factors to improve our sleep quality by avoiding some of these crazy kind of hidden things and also incorporating positive things that we know is going to help us to improve our sleep and so simple here for this particular one with sugar finish if you're having some you know dessert or you know something sweet have that in a little bit earlier part of of your day if possible give your body again a couple of hours to just process and get normalized with your blood sugar and your you know your pancreas and glucagon all this stuff to get normalized and also let's choose higher quality carbohydrates especially in the later part of the day so instead of going for the you know white rice maybe we're doing some sweet potato not to say that you can't have the white rice you know, so maybe you do some sprouted brown rice and just making sure that we get in a nice amount of fiber because now we understand how important fiber is for our sleep cycles. All right. So I hope that that makes sense and just finding ways to be more creative and going a little bit easier on the sugar period. We know that sugar is highly addictive and it has so many detrimental impacts on our health. But for some of us, we think of terms of like sugar is just this, it's the, that bag of white stuff but there's sugar in so many different food products in different forms, right? Fruit is sugar dominant food, but it's gonna have a different impact depending on the type of fruit and how much you eat because of the fiber and the micronutrients. But for some of us, it can tip us in the wrong direction, even fruit, which is considered to be generally healthy. So just keeping that all in mind and and understanding the role that this stuff plays. So this is where we we want to focus on getting ourselves. And it really doesn't take that long as long as you're stacking conditions. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today when I share with you an optimal 
nighttime routine and the different components that you can utilize, that you can pick and choose from or take the whole shebang and create an epic nighttime ritual to get epic sleep and have epic days every day. So I want to share with you really quickly how every habit is essentially created. And this comes from the work of Charles Duhigg in his book, The Power of Habit. Now, every habit begins with a psychological pattern called a habit loop. All right, it's called a habit loop. And this is a three-part process. The first part, there's a cue, right? There's a trigger of some sort that tells your brain to go into automatic mode and let the behavior happen. So Michael Hyatt, who was on the show recently, this incredible episode, he talked about something called activation triggers. So things that initiate behavior for you. So for him, he has his lights shut off automatically in his office at, I believe, five o'clock to let him know he has to get out of the office, right? He's trained himself. He's created this activation trigger so that he's not bleeding over and not sticking to what he holds most dear, which he's crushing it in his business, but his family matters first. So for him to unplug, get out of the office, he set an activation trigger that you can't be here. Lights go off. You don't have to go home, but you got to get the heck out of here. That's how he set it, set it up. And so we need to create these activation triggers for ourselves. We already have them, but oftentimes they're for behaviors that might not be advantageous to us. So first thing, there's a trigger. There's a cue. Then there's the routine aspect. And this is where the behavior itself happens. So you have the trigger, then you have the behavior itself. And this is what people think oftentimes when they think about habits is this part. So the actual action for Michael Hyatt is for him to leave his office. That's the, that's the habit aspect. That's the routine aspect that we see on the surface. But there was first a trigger. The third step that he talks about in The Power of Habit is the reward. This is very important, the reward. And this is something that your brain likes that helps it to remember this habit loop in the future. So you get something by doing the habit. And so often we try to change our habits. We're very good at creating, quote, bad habits in our culture. You know, people have a, a smoking habit or a drinking habit or a sugar habit or a sex habit. Shout out to um, Eric Benet, messing it up with Holly Berry. But the thing is, we have these different habits that are not serving us in one way or another, and they are popularized. But we don't talk about all the good habits that people can construct, right? We really don't hear much information out there about that. And you know what? Here's some things to help you to create healthy habits versus all this conversation about bad habits and the, and the drama that they bring. So you can create these good habits, but you have to anchor them, right? We have to have that reward, and we leave that part out oftentimes, and this is really the secret. So now that you know about the habit loop, we can go ahead and dive in a little bit deeper. And I love this quote, and this is from Samuel Johnson, and I've said this quote many times. I love this quote so much. The chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. The chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. Your life is really a result of your habits. The life that you have right now in this moment is a result of your habits. It's not the things that you've done every now and then. It's the things that you've done consistently that have led you to this point. And moving forward, your habits are going to create the life of your future. And this is the opportunity to be a conscious creator of those things and not let the environment dictate what you do with your life. So when it comes to building your nighttime rituals, it starts with this very important word, which is consistency, right? Consistency. This is really the, the foundation of the whole thing. And consistency, specifically in time, in the time that you do these things in your life, is going to help to really solidify this evening ritual. And this is a major key from everything from brain health to fat loss to maximum sleep benefits, which you're going to learn about. And little do people know there's this new phenomenon out there when people are jumping around in the times that they're going to bed based on what day of the week it is, 
based on the different activities, what might be on TV, what's going on with the kids, and jumping around in their, in their sleep time and creating this new phenomenon called social jet lag, right? Social jet lag. So we think that, that Friday rolls around, just got paid Friday night, money in my pocket. Hey, right? We, we, Friday's here, time to go and, and just, you know, let the hair down, get out, go do stuff. Um, go out, it's the weekend, finally, time to sleep in as well. Stay up late, sleep in. And experts have found that this can throw off your biological clock as if you've flown across the country. And, and many people are doing this every single weekend. And this social jet lag is, and this is a quote from Till Ron, Ronneberg, and he's a PhD professor at the University of Munich Institute of Medical Psychology in Germany. He says, the discrepancy between what our body clock wants us to do and what our social clock wants us to do is what social jet lag really is. And it almost looks as if people on Friday evening fly from Paris to New York City and then back home on Monday morning, they fly back again. That's really what's kind of going on in our bodies with the change in the timing. And so this is why Mondays, they call it, they call it the Monday blues. Right, you got a case of the Mondays, right? What's wrong? You got a case of Mondays? This is what we're seeing here, and what makes Mondays so difficult for people is because the sleep cycle has been thrown off so much. It's this so, social jet lag we're creating for ourselves, and we're gonna come back and talk more about this. So I want you to understand this really important term, which is biological rhythms. Biological rhythms. Your body, as crazy as it sounds is lined up literally in sync with the dernal patterns of the planet, right? It's it's in sync with also the nighttime patterns of the planet. You're synced up with nature. We're kind of hiding out from nature a little bit, but nature still finds us, right? We're still in sync with nature. And so our bodies are looking for a very specific day and night cycle. This is how we've evolved. But only today can we basically manufacture a second daytime and just throw all uh, caution to the wind, do the laptop lab dance till early in the wee hours of the morning because we can, you know, we can today. Whereas our ancestors knew no such thing, right? So we're creating this kind of social jet lag and we're living in it. Many people are living in this and just kind of it's looming over them all the time. And they're wondering why they don't feel well. So underlying everything is the consistency and understanding the biological rhythm, right? Your body is always looking for a pattern to sync up with nature. That consistency is really the key. So we're going to come back and talk about this more, but I want to dive in and talk about the brain health, fat loss, sleep benefits here a little bit more. So let's look at this evening ritual, this consistency and the influence that it has on our body weight, for example. Now, there's a recent study that was published in the journal Current Biology where they looked at the habits of 65,000 adults and found that people with different workday and weekend sleep schedules had tripled the odds of being overweight. What? Crazy, huh? That's straight up nuts. And even more, the body mass index of overweight people tended to rise as the gap between their weekday and weekend time zones widen. So the more that they strayed from their weekday routine, the, the more that their body mass index grew as well. There's a correlation directly from that. So that should be pretty eye-opening in and of itself to notice a pattern like that. And this is speaking to all of the really miraculous things that are happening for your metabolism while you're asleep. And we've covered many of these on the show and gone in depth into them. And one of those is melatonin, right? We know about melatonin as this glorified sleep hormone, but it's also a powerhouse hormone to support your metabolism and fat loss. But again, this isn't, these aren't the things you'll, you'll hear about in popular media yet. We're, we're changing that. We're pushing this into culture. But behind the scenes, this has been well known by researchers for a long time and its, in, and its influence. So 
Uh, and how does this work? Well, uh, this was in the journal Pineal Research. And this study demonstrated that melatonin increases your body's production of something called brown adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue or brown fat or bad fat. Right, you can call it bad fat for short. And brown adipose tissue functions more like muscle in the fact that it burns white adipose tissue. All right. Think of the Joker. All right. This is kind of the gooey stuff that we're trying to get rid of. All right. So this is really the, the disparity here with these two different types of fat. So brown fat is kind of, quote, good fat uh, physically, our physical good fat. And the more that our body produces it, the more that we're going to burn off this excess body fat. Melatonin does that. And here's the ma major key is that it's only secreted in optimal amounts with a consistent light and dark cycle. Okay, it's only secreted in optimal amounts with a consistent light and dark cycle. You, your body needs darkness in order to produce optimal amounts of melatonin. And the shorter we're making our darkness window, the less we're getting the benefits of melatonin, specifically for this aspect we're talking about. But there's many other things that melatonin is obviously important for as well. So we're setting ourselves up for failure, essentially, when we're blocking out having a consistent evening routine and ritual by throwing caution to the wind and diving into the new Iron Fist series on Netflix. And shout out, I love it, love it. Marvel fan, DC fan as well. I want to create any controversy out there. Uh, somebody posted the other day, it's like, Sean, I love Marvel. Marvel's better than DC, I'll admit that, but Batman's better than all of them. It's like, hey, gotta respect that, bro. Gotta respect it. So, obviously, another crucial impact that melatonin has on our overall health and performance is our sleep quality itself. And we've done a, an episode recently talking about how melatonin is a big influence over your body's sleep cycle, right? So we broke down in the episode on energy and building physical energy, which we'll put that in the show notes if you happen to have missed it. Incredible, powerhouse episode. But your brain is cycling in and out of different, uh, different stages. And those stages are what dictate what area of sleep we are in. And each area of sleep we're in are, is correlated with different uh, endocrine processes and nervous system processes. So hormone function, nervous system function, depending on what your brain waves are doing. And melatonin is uh, a gear shift to help your body to move in and out of those stages of sleep, if that makes sense. So if melatonin is not being produced at an optimal level or it's even suppressed, you're not going to be cycling through your normal stages of sleep properly. And even if you got eight hours of time unconscious on a mattress, you might wake up feeling like a hot mess, right? A hot flaming mess of poo, all right? You're going to take your bag and we're going to light it on fire. That's how I do. You might end up like that. You don't want to end up like that. And the big key here is making sure we're producing optimal amounts of melatonin every night. Give our body what it deserves. Now, another aspect of having a consistent evening routine is that it naturally reduces cortisol. Because as we talked about earlier, probably the biggest leverage point of having a consistent nighttime routine is the fact that it eliminates the uncertainty surrounding sleep. And it takes a big part of the stress away. And that's what we want to do for ourselves. Not just for the fact of the kind of uh, noticeable outer perimeter of it where we feel less stress. But what's going on in our bodies when we reduce cortisol? So one of the big things that happens here is that we're protecting our lean muscle mass. Cortisol has been given a bad name and is treated like a straight up villain, but it's not just misunderstood. Cortisol is actually one of the most important hormones that we have. It does so many different things. It even helps with our thyroid function. It's just so many good things that it does. But when it's produced in the wrong amounts and at the wrong time, then it can truly truly cause some problems for us in the fact that reducing cortisol can help to protect your muscle mass because cortisol can tear your muscle down. It can literally start to break down all of that muscle that you've worked so hard to build and turn it into glucose, right? It's a process called gluconeogenesis. Cortisol can break down your valuable 
lean muscle tissue, which muscle is your body's fat burning machinery. We really have to understand that over and over and over again. Muscle is your body's fat burning machinery. When people talk about how can I burn fat, get rid of fat, you need to build some muscle. That's the machinery that burns that stuff away. But cortisol, being in a hyper stress state, can literally tear that machinery down. Not cool. Not cool. So that's number one, protects your lean muscle mass. Also, reduction in cortisol. Cortisol is catabolic. It's a very catabolic hormone, which you need things to break you down. Catabolic basically means breaking down of things. That enables the building up. Like you need both. You can't just stay the same. There's this constant process always happening of breakdown, build up, breakdown, build up, right? But we need the build up part too. And so many of us are stuck in this kind of catabolic state more often. We're not getting a, that anabolic side. So catabolic versus anabolic. So when cortisol is reduced, there's an instant increase in anabolism, right? This building up of recovery, rejuvenation, growth, right? That's what we want. Also, with a reduction in cortisol, through having a consistent evening routine, reduces stress-induced inflammation. A big part of carrying around excess weight is its inflammation. You know, your body is a protective mechanism to help to buffer inflammation. It's like little fire, basically. Inflamed, inflamed flames. It's like kind of this internal fire that's happening in our cells. So this helps to reduce that inflammation. And to just even throw in an extra little nugget here, with our sleep quality being influenced by optimal melatonin, we're intrinsically going to have optimal amounts of testosterone, which is another one of these anabolic, very beneficial hormones for men and women having the right ratios of testosterone. And we did an entire episode dedicated specifically to the impact that sleep has on sex and that ha sex has on sleep and this really interesting relationship that these two things have. And it's actually called sleeping together sometimes, right? And it's incredible when you look at the data and how these two things influence each other. But testosterone is a big player in that whole equation. And there was a study that was published in 2011 that I talked about in that episode and this was in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And they found that young men who were sleep deprived over one week, just one week, five, five days, so this one work week, and they were getting just five hours of sleep per night, saw their testosterone levels drop by 15%. And that might not sound like a lot, but that was as if they were suddenly 10 to 15 years older. Simply from being sleep deprived, having an abnormal sleep cycle, for just five days. And so how often, again, are we doing this in smaller doses sometimes? Of course, you know, maybe we're getting, you know, we're seven hours over here, then five, then six and a half, then eight, and just kind of bouncing around, make up for it on the weekend. All this inconsistency can be just as negative as having a straight, consistent time of having the same amount of sleep, which is probably under what your, body, what your body really needs, all right? Because it's all about the biological rhythms. And that's the big takeaway from today. That's something to write down, remember, biological rhythms. Now, before we get to the optimal evening routines, let's move on and talk about heart health, right? Let's talk about our heart health and how the evening routine, the consistency in our ritual, our nighttime ritual, has an impact on your heart health. This is crazy. Listen to this. The number of heart attacks from that one hour change with daylight savings time, the number of heart attacks increases by 24% on the Monday after the spring daylight saving time. Huh? Crazy, right? And this was compared uh, with the daily average for the week surrounding the start of daylight saving time. And this was, in a, this was a 2014 study. This was published in the journal Open Heart. All right? And this is becoming a little bit more well-known. This is, I saw this in the media a little bit more this year as the daylight savings times just passed. But what? 24% increase in heart attacks. That's how, that's like a collective sleep deprivation of a lot of people at once. That's why the number rises like that. Now, even more interesting, this was a 2016 study. It's a little bit more recent. 
that was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Neurology found that the overall rate for stroke was 8% higher in the two days after daylight savings time. And people who were older than 65 were 20% more likely to have a stroke after the spring daylight savings time. So just a change in the consistent evening routine, just like that, increases our risk of health problems. And I love this statement by Christopher Barnes, and he's an associate professor at the University of Washington. And he said that when we change the time by one hour, it throws a monkey wrench into our circadian process. And he said that the following Monday, we've discovered that people have about 40 minutes less sleep on average. And because, this is the big key here, because we're already often short on sleep to begin with, the effects of this just 40 minutes is even more noticeable. And that's really the key. We're already crazy pants with our sleep quality, sleep consistency. And then we throw this in the mix. That's why we see those spikes. So not just because you had uh, uh, less sleep in, in one night, in one instance, because your body's very, very resilient and you're going to be fine, you know, especially, you know, people who've got kids, we've got stuff going on. You're going to have times where you don't get the best sleep at night, but that doesn't mean you're going to ha- have a higher risk necessarily of having any of these issues. It's when it's a consistent thing, plus a bigger sleep deprivation on top of that. That's where the problems really come into play. So we've covered the impact that an evening routine can have on your weight, that can have on your heart health, what's going on in your brain, really, really powerful influence that it has. So let's dive in and change gears and talk a little bit more about creating an optimal evening ritual for yourself. And this starts with going back to when you were the baby you, all right? Stroll back in time with me. So for myself, for example, when I was younger, uh, up until the age of around six, I lived with my grandmother, and it was a very uh, consistent structure in life there in that household with her. And my evening routine was set. Like, I remember it so clearly. Even then, we had a specific evening routine, and I, I just remember sleeping so good. And uh, the first thing was we'd take a bath. i I I get a bath. She'd uh, have me take a bath. And I remember just, you know, getting dried off and just uh, having a nice warm towel and putting on, next thing was putting on the pajamas, right? There's another neural association linked to that process, right? I'm putting on my bedtime clothes, okay? That's a powerful activation trigger, okay? So, and of course, it was the one, the onesie thing with the, with the feet, right? With the, the whole jump in with the zipper, right? Some adults still wear those today, apparently. I've seen out on Instagram. But, you know, I had one of those bad boys or a few of those. Put that on. Those were my pajamas. And then I would be ushered upstairs to my bed. And from there, uh, we would say our prayers. You know, she'd have me say my prayers. And I would do that. And at the end of the prayer... My prayer ended with saying, um, and I'm thankful for, and then I would list all the people that I'm thankful for in my life. And sometimes the list would be pretty long, but my grandmother would bear with me. She's probably ready to go to bed herself. But, um, you know, I'd do that process. She'd tuck me in, and then I went to sleep. After leaving that consistent environment of my grandmother's house and moving in with my mother, the routine was much more sporadic and unpredictable for sure. There was not really a, a, a routine involved. And as a result, you know, my sleep was a lot, a lot more unpredictable, obviously, in of itself. And I cannot say that this is the cause, but there's definitely a correlation to my behavior changing, where I would start to get in a lot more trouble when I changed schools as well. But of course, the in- environment's going to influence that as well. But I remember thinking like I should not do this thing and still doing it anyways, right? There was like this break there in my social control, right? That prefrontal cortex that starts to go cold when you're more sleep deprived. And UC Berkeley actually did brain imaging scans and they showed this and actually showed those scans in my book, Sleep Smarter, and found that that prefrontal cortex, quote, goes cold and the amygdala, the more reaction-based part of your brain lights up. And so 
I would get to basically a point where I'm like, I, I wonder how I'm going to get in trouble today, right? And it's just like <laughs> having the two things on your shoulder. But this is the thing is you, you start to become aware of these things when you get a little bit older, like, wait a minute, why, why was that stuff going on? Because we don't really know when we're in it oftentimes. And that carried over into my teenage years where um, I definitely saw various times when in high school specifically, I remember freshman year, of high school, I felt so many times like I was just straight up in a dream. I just couldn't wake up. I was not fully there. Like I know that I'm I'm not here. I'm not fully Sean. I'm not fully here in my body. And I would use like caffeine gum and like Surge. I don't know if you remember Surge, this crazy soda with all this caffeine in it. They straight gave that out for free. They came to our school and there was like containers of it. You get free Surge. Why would you do that? Why would you do that to kids? And so that and a few other things just try to wake me up. And eventually that kind of pro- progressed out of that, if, if I could say that, to where I didn't really feel like that anymore. But I don't know if I just came, became adapted to not fully being present. And this was also leading up to the time where, you know, I had the bone degeneration disease take over where I broke my hip shortly thereafter. And also the ultimate diagnosis of this spinal degeneration because I was so malnutrition and so unhealthy. But I know that my sleep was unhealthy as well. And patterns were, were, were created when I was younger. But I did have that snapshot of what it was like to have a consistent routine. So now I want to share with you, as an adult, how we can employ these things and bring them back into our lives to have the health and the body and the consistency, consistency that we really want. So the optimal evening routine and and This is an important caveat. You can take pieces of this, and this isn't going to be in a specific strict order, but I'm just laying out some things and how I've been doing them and how what I found to be successful and what I've employed in patients' lives as I've worked, you know, clinically over the years as well. So the optimal evening routine is generally going to begin an hour before you plan on going to bed. So if you plan on getting to bed at 1030, you're going to start this process at 930. First step is shutting off or putting away all of your blue light emitting devices. All right, this is the first thing. When the evening routine kicks into play, we're getting off our blue light blocking devices. And why does this matter? Well, there's a study conducted by Harvard Medical School that found that exposure to light at night throws the body's hormonal clock out of whack and devastates your sleep quality. Researchers conducted an experiment looking at the effects of blue light exposure at night, like you get from the screens of your everyday tech devices, to exposure of green light of comparable brightness. The blue light suppressed melatonin for twice as long as the green light and shifted circadian rhythms by twice as much. And basically, every hour of blue light exposure suppressed melatonin for an additional 30 minutes. I've shared this many times before. So this is one of those things that you're seeing a lot on the interwebs, different articles you hear in the media. I've been talking about this for half a decade. We have to have a better relationship with our tech devices. I love, love my iPhone. We're friends. We have an understanding because I know that sometimes they can take advantage of me, right? Sometimes they can take me for granted, mistake my kindness for weakness. And I say, look, iPhone, we got to talk about this. We got to change some things. And they're always like, okay, cool. Just turn me off. I'll see you tomorrow. So that's really kind of, Understanding what's happening behind the scenes with this and what it's doing to your melatonin, your sleep cycle, your biological rhythms. This is why this is a valuable thing to do. So with that said, we have to fill that space with something of greater or equal value. We talked about this earlier about habit creation. We have to have the pleasure component. We have to something that the brain likes. The brain already likes Instagram. It likes Twitter, Facebook, YouTube videos. We can't just go cold turkey like that. You have to fill that with something of greater or equal value. And we'll talk about what some of those things can look like in a moment. But and or there are hacks that we can use because I'm not perfect about this by any means. But on a consistent basis, for the majority of time, this is what I'm doing. However, if we are going to watch a a movie a little bit later than normal or or TV show or I have to work a little bit more, something kind of unexpected or I'm working on. Um, you know, maybe some research or whatever the case might be. This is when an hour before my uh, 
prospective bedtime to break out the blue light blocking tools. So whether it's on your iPhone, set it and forget it. Use the tool on your phone built into your phone right now called Night Shift. Set the time, set it and forget it. And it pulls out the most troublesome spectrum of light automatically from your screen. All right. That one thing, super simple. For your computers, desktop, laptops, Flux, F.LUX. Great app. I've been using it for about four years. Again, just go to Dr. Google, type in F.LUX. A couple clicks, boom, it's on your computer. Set it and forget it. And it works like gangbusters. All right. Now, what is gangbusters anyways? My uh, <laughs> engineer is here in the studio with me. Yeah, yeah. Usually he got uh, random insights and trivia, things like that. But do you know what gangbusters is? It's a police officer that bust up gangs. Okay. Well, there you have it. And so it is. Now we all know what gangbusters are. It's gangbusters or ghostbusters. Shout out to Slimer, Peter Vankman. All right, now, um, also, for all the kind of ambient light and the other lights in your house besides the television, laptop, desktop, stuff like that, blue light blocking glasses, right? So basically, this is screen protection. Your eyes and that blue light are sort of like having, having sex. They're kind of having sex. You need to wear protection or you might get something, all right? So I yeah, hope you understand that. So... That protection is the blue light blocking glasses and or these different apps on our devices. So for the glasses that I use, and I've tried so many, I use Swannies because they actually look cool and they work amazing, like over 99% effectiveness for blocking out blue light. And so you can go to themodelhealthshow.com forward slash glasses. You can find the Swannies, a special discount there only for us. All right, the modelhealthshow.com forward slash glasses. So when it basically gets dark outside, I throw my swannies on and just go on about my business. So that's number one, an hour before bed. Next up, body work. All right, body work. This is something that you can employ into your nighttime routine. With body work, we start with basic massage. So massage helps to release endorphins. Okay, and these are kind of these feel good compounds that buffer stress, it reduces stress in your body. And then there's acupressure, right? There's acupressure. And there's a comprehensive study that was conducted, uh, and this was done in Italy, and it found that 60% of patients with sleep disorders had an improvement in sleep quality after two weeks of acupressure treatment. Crazy, 60% of people had improvement. And they used the uh, H HT7 point, which is right here at the bottom of your wrist, if you could see this on YouTube, and just manipulating that point and it also helps to increase the metabolites, the melatonin metabolites. So your body's either producing more slash using it more efficiently as well, simply by, I mean, it's crazy, right? Touching a point on your wrist can do that, bananas. But your body is all, it has this really intricate hyper-intelligence, this innate intelligence that's governing all this stuff and everything is connected. So fascinating stuff. Also, of course, partner massage. This could be a little bit more interesting or, or uh, something you enjoy more than scrolling on Twitter, maybe. But a partner massage, you get the added benefit of oxytocin, right? This is kind of the love compound. The cuddle is often referred to as the cuddle hormone. But clinically, this has been found, and I cited the study in Sleep Smarter, to protect your body against the effects of cortisol. So oxytocin benefit. And then there's self-massage as well. Um, you could do the manipulation with the acupressure. You could do the foam rolling. You can do, uh, I like to get a tennis ball and roll that under my foot, or you can use a lacrosse ball, which you gotta, you know, it could be a little bit more tender if you're pressing down on that lacrosse ball. But these are different options because there's a lot of acupressure points on, your, on the bottom of your feet. And of course the, you know, the foam rolling, like I mentioned, but um, something that Dr. Kelly Starrett talked about and I literally added this chapter to Sleep Smarter uh, the big version that was published with Rodale uh, because of his insight and the fact that in your gut you have the uh, vagus nerve that connects your gut to your brain and we know how we're very very good in our society as humans to go from zero to a hundred we can go from zero to a hundred real quick some people are gonna know what that what I'm saying right there you can go from zero to a hundred real quick but going from 100 to zero, not so easy. 
not so easy. All right. Now, how can we do that? The vagus nerve actually sends data, more data, about 90% of the information is your, your vagus nerve in your gut, from your gut to your brain, telling your brain what to do. So to slow down, shut down. It's so basically a parasympathetic hack, a parasympathetic nervous system activation you can get by getting one of those little, uh, often referred to as a princess ball. Those little rubber balls are like in the big bin at Walmart, right? Grab one of those little balls and you lay, put it down on the floor, then you lay your body on top of it. You lay your belly on top of that ball and just work it around in that abdominal um architecture, all right, and massaging in there. And that's one of those things that can help to activate that parasympathetic nervous system. And I feel that even five minutes would suffice. And another thing that we can add into our evening ritual, and this was a study, this was published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology and Occupational Physiology, found that a hot bath 90 minutes before bed improved sleep quality and helped participants to get greater amounts of deep anabolic sleep. Mm -mm -mm. How did, how do parents know? How do my grandma know? You know, that, that nice hot bath a little bit before bed. So specifically, it's 90 minutes out. I want to make this clear because getting out of the bathtub and going straight to bed, you know, within maybe 10 minutes, not the best idea because your body temperature is still elevated. And we've talked about this many times, uh, thermal regulation and this process that your body undergoes there's literally a drop in your core body temperature when it gets dark outside to help facilitate sleep. And if we forcefully elevate that really close to when we go to bed, that can be a problem. Same thing with exercising too late because it elevates your core body temperature. And it's kind of a little bit more difficult to bring it down via the exercise because there's so many internal things firing, if that makes sense. Whereas in the tub, this is more of like a, uh, an external influence. And your body, and here's the, the really cool part, is that taking the hot bath, your body temperature actually drops lower than it would have after a certain amount of time. So it helps to even support that core body temperature drop if you time things appropriately. That's why they say 90 minutes here. So this is something that I like to do from time to time. I don't do this on a consistent basis, but especially if I know that I'm you know, sore or maybe I've had a rough night of sleep uh, maybe the night before, this is something I like to add into the mix, and I'll do a magnesium soak. So I'll actually add uh, this incredible magnesium. It's called Deep Soak, and this is actually from Activation Products where I get my Ease Magnesium Spray that I use every night. And so this is something that you add to your bath water, and you can find that at easemagnesium.com forward slash model as well. So you can check that out there. So I'll do that, which speeds recovery, because basically we're talking about the historical uses of Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate. This is a super critical extract. This is like a thousand times more effective and you can use such a smaller amount. And man, it makes you feel so good. Like you feel really, really relaxed. So that's another thing that you can add into your evening routine. But if you're going to do this, make it consistent, even a hot shower, you know, but um, make sure you give yourself a little bit of time for your core body temperature to come back down. Another part here to, again, shift gears with what's going on with your brain you know, especially for people who have a lot of inner chatter, you got to really do this. And setting yourself up for success the next day is journaling. You know, you could do a little bit of journaling slash scripting your day for tomorrow. I love doing that, that process of writing out the things that I'm going to accomplish, you know, those bullet points. And there's this really interesting thing. Your brain is always looking to solve puzzles, solve patterns, and your unconscious mind is able to work overnight to help you to fulfill those goals much easier, all right? And there's sound research on this as well. So utilize the power of your mind and your unconscious mind, your subconscious mind, by scripting out your day the night before. That's a really, really nice thing. It also helps to kind of put stuff out of your head. Another thing that you can employ here is to read. Read a physical book. And this is a practice that I employ most nights of the week. I'm going to be reading something uh, as part of my evening ritual. And or you can listen to an audio book or podcast, all right? This doesn't require you to stare into the screen the whole time. You could just turn the podcast on or the audio book and have your headphones on and just chill. You know, this is a really valuable, cool thing that you can do that 
is on par with, you know, just kind of surfing around, looking at random YouTube videos. There can be uh, some of the same benefits that you find there in, you know, maybe you're studying some marketing material or relationship advice, whatever it is, you can get in audiobook form or podcast form. So I really like to do that as well. And this is something that my wife definitely does. She, she does that far more often. And speaking of wives, aka significant others, one of the other parts of your evening process could be to have some fun with them, you know, to hang out with them, to talk, to actually talk to your significant other, talk to your spouse. It's crazy. I know it sounds crazy, but you can actually have a conversation with them and ask them what's going on in their life, what their goals are, what's what's going on in the day, what, what their plans are for tomorrow, what they're interested in, you know. You can talk to another human being and also your significant other. Hopefully, as we talked about on the sex slash sleep episode, this is another thing that could be added to your sleep process, your sleep routine. But this is something that we don't want to like schedule like, okay, 930, we're going to uh, it's a missionary. And no, we're not talking about being some kind of robotic thing here. We're talking about just open the opportunity for that by you not being distracted by being on Instagram. Okay. And I'm not trying to diss Instagram. I love Instagram. Again, holler at me on Instagram at Sean model at S H A W N M O D E L for that, uh, recovery protein recipe. All right. If you want to get that from me. So I love Instagram, but your relationships, your most intimate relationships are far more important. And so hopefully that would be more entertaining than being on Instagram and Facebook and watching YouTube videos if you have some intimate connection with your significant other. Another part of this evening process for me is as I'm walking back to the bedroom, I, I turn the temperature down because we talked about the thermal regulation already. And the optimal temperature, according to experts, is between 62 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the optimal range. My wife, she's from Kenya. She doesn't like the cold that much. She doesn't like it, all right? But she does find that her sleep is so much better when she is cooler, when the, when the environment is cooler. Of course, you got her covers and things like that. Her issue, though, is getting out of the bed in the morning when it's cold. She's like, it's just I, the covers are too cozy. So what I do are kind of happy medium. I get out of bed first, and I go turn the heat up. And that's what we do, and it's worked out great for us. Next thing is um, shutting out all the artificial light in your bedroom. This should be an automatic part of your nighttime ritual. And I said artificial light. So this is if you're in uh, suburban neighborhoods or city kind of uh, urban areas where you've got street lights coming in and uh, cars, car lights, you know, these LEDs and uh, maybe your porch light, neighbor's porch light, that kind of thing beaming into your bedroom. You want to shut those things out. Make sure you get yourself some blackout curtains if your environment's like that. If you live in an environment where you're not exposed to those things, don't worry about it. We're not talking about natural light, moonlight, light from the stars, things like that. Humans have evolved with those things. That's all good. If you look at their lux, you know, the luminance from those things, and now there's a luminance chart, this lux chart in Sleep Smarter, you see that moonlight is negligible, like super, super, it's almost reverse bad for you. You know, it's like, well, reverse bad for you, that's good for you. So, and, and it's benefits, right? And so it also is another one of these influences over our cycles, you know, our biological rhythms is moonlight. So shut out artificial light, brush your teeth, all right, brush your teeth. That's another thing that's a part of your bedtime ritual, but just doing it in the same process, plugging it in in a certain position consistently helps your brain to know that it's getting ready for bed. And for me, after I brush my teeth, this is when I rub the magnesium Uh, topical magnesium into my skin. And this is something I've been doing for many, many years. I travel with it when I just got uh, back from this trip to the Philippines. You better believe I brought my Ease Magnesium along with me. And here is why. This is why. The Journal of Research and Medical Sciences found that supplementation of magnesium has been found to improve factors such as sleep efficiency, total sleep time, sleep onset. So this is falling asleep after you get into bed, so you, the sleep latency, preventing early morning awakenings, and the ISI, and this is the insomnia severity index, so improving that score. And on the other side, 
And this was with objective measure. So this is actually using monitors. Magnesium supplementation literally improves concentrations of serum renin. And renin is basically a marker of shifts in your sleep stages. So that you know you're, you're going in and out of sleep stages efficiently. Melatonin. Magnesium helps your body to optimize melatonin. And serum cortisol were lowered. All of these things were improved just from magnesium supplementation. This is the number one mineral deficiency in our world today. Over 320 enzymatic processes magnesium is responsible for. So basically there's over 300 things your body cannot do or cannot do efficiently if magnesium is not present. It's also known as this kind of anti-stress mineral. And we are exposed to a very abnormal amount of stress today. Even if we live a pretty, quote, stress-free life, just the air quality, the food quality, we're not, for the most part, most of us are not out foraging for our food. Like, we're getting deficient food. You know, things are different today. And we need things to help us to adapt and to buffer. Magnesium is one of these critical compounds. And so for that, this is what I use. Because taking an oral supplement for this and trying to get it in orally, you're probably not going to be able to get your magnesium levels up to where you need to because if you take even a little bit more than your bowel tolerance, right, you have a certain bowel tolerance for magnesium, if you take even a little bit more, you'll create disaster pants, okay? You'll create di diarrhea. So this is, and that's not a fish, like now we're like flushing out our body, like now you've created a flush, right? And you're gonna lose minerals and things like that kind of abnormally. So the most efficient way to do this is through a transdermal application, through topical treatment, rubbing magnesium in through your skin, all right, over 99.9% .9 absorbable from this magnesium, not from stuff you'll find out there in the stores. And I've tried, like we're talking maybe 20% absorbable and it's lower quality and you're wasting your money. This is why I use Ease and I've been using it for so long. And I've the stories that I've heard from it, it might not just be for somebody improving their sleep quality, or for relaxing their muscles or things like that, but just getting people out of pain, the stories that I've heard. And we had one of those stories actually recently on uh, the Model Health Show when we did the live episode in Washington, D.C. And I was told I had no idea that, you know, somebody was sharing a story and they shared a story about their, their mom, you know, who's the grandma, you know, so, and grandma happened to be there. So he passed the mic to her and she shared her experience and how she's just walking around trying to spray people. Like, oh, you heard because of the benefits that it had for her. And uh, it was just such a cute story, but also is very, very heartwarming. And it makes me proud and it makes me so grateful that we have these things available to us. So make sure if you don't have this already, get yours. Make sure that you have this and use it. Put it next to your nightstand. Put it in your bathroom. Um, Ease Magnesium. So this is E-A-S-E magnesium so that's easemagnesium.com forward slash model hey if you like this video make sure to check out this video right here to up level your health today this isn't called sleep more right it's sleep smarter and there are many people who sleep you know eight to nine hours and they wake up feeling like straight up you know hot garbage you know what i'm saying 